you is that you are somewhat uneasy about the relationship between rules and religion and your discomfort is interesting because we're all trying to follow Jesus here and Jesus as you know was a first century Jew and to a first century Jew the relationship between rules and religion was pretty tight uh, so much so that uh, the people were the people who were seen to be authentically Jewish were the people who followed the rules of the Jewish faith the most important of which had to do with the whole business of keeping the Sabbath in Jesus' day being a Jew and following the Jewish rules of the Jewish Sabbath were one and the same thing and the reason that this interests me is that most of the people in this cinema have at some point in their past been exposed to a form of religion that has used rules as a litmus test of authenticity and the net result of that exposure has been a residual feeling of guilt right one of the things that church does best is it makes us all feel bad uh, for example if you belong to a church that has a rule written or unwritten that a genuine Christian goes to church every single Sunday and you miss a Sunday you feel guilty and in the religion business guilt is good <clears throat> guilt keeps you coming guilt keeps you giving guilt keeps you compliant in this morning's episode we're going to read a little bit about Jesus and the rules of the Sabbath and just to set you up for that let me first of all tell you that the word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word Shabbat which as I'm sure you know simply means to rest now let's pause on that word for a moment rest is this a bad word of course not quite the contrary you work hard all day customers were difficult to come by and your boss was a nightmare and you crawl back into your house of a night time and you uncork a bottle of wine and you sit on the sofa and you rest it's been a brutal week and you look forward to Friday night so that you can get some rest it's been a difficult year and you're looking forward to your summer vacation so that you can get some rest this positive concept comes from the fourth of the Ten Commandments which says Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter nor your manservant or your maidservant. And during Jesus' lifetime, these words were regarded as being among the most important in the entire Bible so important that the rabbis who lived around the time of Jesus offered prolific <coughs> guidance on what a person could and could not do on the Sabbath day and this guidance no doubt initially intended to be helpful eventually became a long list of rules there's a section in the Mishnah that lists 39 activities each of which has its own subsection uh, that, that might be regarded as work and therefore illegal on the Sabbath. For example, tying a knot was regarded as work and therefore against the rules. Stowing. Sewing more than one stitch on an item of clothing was regarded as work and therefore against the rules. Walking for more than 199 paces on the entire Sabbath day was regarded as work and therefore against the rules. And these rules were comprehensive. There was no question on the Sabbath that the rabbis didn't have an answer for. For example, there's a line in the Mishnah that says this. If a building falls down on the Sabbath, enough rubble may be removed to discover if any victims are dead or alive. If alive, they may be rescued, but if dead, the corpses must be left until sunset. Now it seems to me that you need to be particularly anal to sit down at a committee meeting and say, well, gentlemen, we've covered knot tying and stitch sewing. 
we've determined the appropriate number of days that a Ma uh, pieces that a man may walk upon the Sabbath day, but it's recently come to my attention that we don't yet have a rule pertaining to the proper religious etiquette of natural disasters. <laughs> Therefore, we need to come up with one. This was Jesus' world. A world that defined proper spirituality as being the keeping of religious rules, and those rules went on and on. And if you were really good at knowing what the Sabbath rules were, and if you were really good at keeping them, then you were thought to be an authentic God follower. And if you weren't so good at knowing what those rules were, and you weren't all that good at following them, then you weren't. And if you weren't, you were then left with the feeling that God wasn't very nice and that he didn't like you. Question. Has rules and religion and guilt ever given you this impression? God isn't nice and he doesn't like me. God isn't nice and he doesn't like me. With that in mind, let's turn to the Bible, Mark chapter 2 and verse 23, where we read that one Sabbath, uh-oh, <laughs> Jesus, like a bull in a religious china shop, was going through the cornfields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some ears of corn. So very basically, what's happening here is that the disciples, Peter, James, John, Steve, those guys, are breaking the rules. For example, it was against the rules to walk for more than 1,999 paces on the Sabbath day, and yet here they are taking a journey. It was against the rules to harvest crops on the Sabbath, and yet here they are picking corn to eat. And what I find interesting about this episode is that no sooner are the rules broken than who should appear on the scene as if by magic, but the rule keepers. In the next sentence, we're told that the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Look at the word, look. Question. Is there something about the relationship between rules and religion that makes a person somewhat nasty and mean-spirited? Is there something about all that that causes a person to notice the faults and failures in the lives of another? I ask the question, sadly, with some experience. Way back when I was a student, I went through a, a phase, a very short phase, I'm glad to say, of being uh, very unwholesomely Christian. In this short phase, I would get out of my bed every morning at five o'clock and read my Bible for an hour. And then uh, at six o'clock, having read my Bible for an hour, I would then say my prayers for another hour. So by seven o'clock in the morning, I'd already done two hours of religious activity. And that's fine. That's wholesome if you roll that way. My problem was that having spent two hours of the day in religious activity, I then spent the remaining 22 hours of the day feeling far more Christian than everybody else and feeling particularly attuned to how everyone else might improve upon their practice of the Christian faith. There's something about religion that does this. There's something about religion that if you do it wrong, it makes you mean-spirited and judgmental. There's something about keeping the rules that causes you to notice the ways in which others do not keep the rules. And I think that this is why good religious people are sometimes the worst people you'll ever meet. And in the Gospels, it's always the good, wholesome, Bible-reading, prayer-saying, God-following people who pop up at the most opportune of moments, or inopportune of moments, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Do you, do you know what? They're like your mother. <laughs> Never there when you're behaving. The second you do something wrong, they pop up and, aha, 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Look at the way you're not following the rules. Now the genuineness of your faith must be called into question. Let me just load some more guilt onto your life. Let me confirm your nagging suspicions that God actually isn't nice and that he actually doesn't like you. So in the next sentence, Jesus says, have you never read, in other words, I know that you guys are Bible experts, but have you ever actually read the Bible? For example, have you read about what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathur, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. So at this point, Jesus is referring to a really fun Old Testament story where a man called David is on the run. And one day, hungry and desperate, he goes into the temple, very religious place, and breaking a whole bunch of religious rules, he eats some consecrated bread. Now, in saying this, Jesus isn't saying, okay, fair enough, you've got me. But you see, there's this story in the Bible where David broke the rules when he was hungry, and that's why it's okay for me to break the rules now, because I'm hungry too. He's saying something more profound than that. In popular understanding, David was the archetypical king, the great Messiah of Israel's past. At the time of Jesus, David's memory was, was cherished. It was firmly ingrained in popular mythology. At the end of every synagogue service, for example, the congregation would say, O Lord, cause the branch of your servant David to sprout out once more. You're with me? David was, was huge in the, in, in the popular psyche. So when Jesus talks this way, he's drawing a deliberate comparison between David, the archetypical Messiah king of the past and himself and this is troubling for the Pharisees because they expected that the Messiah would come and validate the silly rules of their religion not flout them as Jesus is so obviously doing here next sentence then Jesus said to them the Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath so, I think that we all know the rules are good. Uh, we all know that we need rules. But when you get into a situation where rules are more important than people, things very quickly become rather silly. Have a look at this. Next slide, please. So this is the MV Hebrides. Uh, this is the ferry that connects the island of Harris uh, in Scotland to the Scottish mainland. And some years ago, when I was in holiday in the island of Harris, just before I uh, got the ferry back home, I uh, called the bus company at the other end and inquired as to what time the bus was leaving the ferry terminal to go to Glasgow. Uh, the lady on the other end of the phone said, and she said it as though it was perfectly normal, and she said it rather officiously, she said, uh, certainly, sir, the bus departs 15 minutes before the ferry arrives. <laughs> now at this point I naturally assumed that I'd misheard her and so I then said I'm sorry did you just say that the bus leaves before the ferry gets there then she says with a tone of voice indicating that I'm the stupid one <laughs> says yes sir I then as you can imagine said well what time does the next bus leave tomorrow <laughs> At this point, the conversation starts to become like a scene from, from Monty Python. <laughs> the lady closed the conversation off by saying what these people always say. By saying the only thing they can say. Well, those are the rules. When I said to her, well, he, you know, here's an idea. Why don't we just, you know... Could you not hold the bus back 15 minutes so that everyone who's stepping off the ferry could, you know, get on the bus rather than having to stay in a bed and breakfast till the next day? Like 15 minutes, no big deal. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. Those are the rules. I don't make the rules. 
But those are the rules. Church is often just a silly. Rules matter more than people. And the principle here is that rules are important, of course they are, but they don't matter as much as we do. Way back at the start of the Bible, the Sabbath commandment was given by God to be a good thing in people's lives. The idea was to introduce regular periods of rest into their busyness, and this is a good thing. But over the years, this good concept of God's good rest had become perverted into silly, lifeless rules. And so by the time of Jesus, the day of rest had become a burden, not a joy. It wasn't about relaxing with family and friends. It was about memorizing what you were and weren't allowed to do on this particular day. And so in this sentence, Jesus simply says, I'm sorry, guys, but you're wrong. God gave you the day of rest to be something good, and you've turned it into something bad. So that rule you have about not walking for more than 1,999 pieces, it's wrong. That rule you have about you know, not tying more than one stitch on a piece of clothing, it's wrong. This day is supposed to be good and fun and refreshing, and you've ruined it. Then in the next sentence, Jesus says, and the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath anyway. So in this sentence, his point is not now some general principle that people matter more than rules. Rather, his point is that he is God, and as God, he is refreshing the Sabbath. He's reversing it to what it was meant to be, a symbol of God's rest. A weekly reminder that God is nice, and he does like us. I'm just about old enough to remember a time when Sundays were not days of rest, they were days of tyranny. My earliest memories of the Christian Sabbath are a collection of things I wasn't allowed to do. I wasn't allowed to watch telly, I wasn't allowed to go out and play, I wasn't allowed to make a lot of noise because it was the Lord's day. And in my early teens I began to think, well if it's the Lord's day, the Lord can keep it because it's rubbish. <laughs> it's boring. I'm from the Highlands of Scotland, and in the Highlands of Scotland, this is how we roll. Have a look at this. That's, that's for real. You see, God isn't nice. God doesn't like you. So he doesn't want you or your kids having fun on Sunday. On Sunday, he wants you to be miserable. Look at this beautiful place, beautiful hills, beautiful sea. Everything about this place is beautiful. And the church have this sign put up. No swinging on the swings on a Sunday. Because God's not nice. He doesn't like you. And all the things that are probably on God's mind, you playing with your kids in the play parks, probably right up there. <laughs> this list of priorities. A lot of us have those sorts of memories of a repressive Sunday and a repressive church. And so we've really reacted against that. And that's good. But that reaction hasn't led us to a wholesome understanding of what it might mean to obey the fourth commandment. We go to church on a Sunday, schedule permitting, but we don't in any sense preserve the Sabbath as a good day of rest or a day of joy. We've rejected a repressive interpretation of these things and we've replaced it with, well, nothing at all. I think that it might be a good idea for us to rediscover the Sabbath, to explore ways of making one day of the week a special day. And that shouldn't be that difficult. One of the things I really like about Canadian culture is that it's rhythmic. We, we cook turkey, we carve pumpkins, we put up decorations, we take out our snow shovels, we put our snow shovels away, we open our cottages, we close our cottages, all at set times of the year because it's time to do so. We should bring this rhythmic understanding of life to Sunday. We're all insanely busy people and in our busyness we should try and hear the command of God once a week. Thou shalt stop doing what you're doing and shall celebrate. 
shall try to find some way of remembering that God is nice and he likes you. I think the church should be a place where you want to go. I think that Sunday should be, should be fun. The church always complains that no one goes. Well, I have a question. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If you've got a shop and no one's going into your shop, you've got to ask questions about what you're selling and how you're selling it, right? Church should ask these questions of itself. God has said to the church, Sunday is a special day. It's a day of celebration, of rest, of joy, of remembering that God is nice and that he likes us and he loves us. And the church should help people to celebrate this. And if church is mind-numbingly boring and lifeless and funless, it doesn't help. This church should be a fun church. It should be the kind of church that you get up on a Sunday morning and there is nowhere else you'd rather be, nothing else you'd rather be doing than here. Then in chapter 3, these controversies that Jesus seems to be getting himself into reach their conclusion. How am I doing for time? Someone shout, shout out the time. Iron Man starts at 12 seconds. <laughs> it does. What? Okay, everyone synchronize watches next Sunday. You're not helping, right? I'm ignoring you. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. So it's the Sabbath. It's the day of rest. It's the day when God's people are supposed to rejoice in God's creation. It's a day when they're supposed to gather together to celebrate their shared belief that God is nice and that he does like them. However, when you're already good at keeping the rules and you've already got a perfect life and you already know all the answers, all that remains for you to do is watch other people. You don't need to come to church to join in. You just need to come to church with your notepad and your pen and observe where everyone else is going wrong. So here's the Pharisees. They're in the place of worship, but they're not there to worship. They're there to watch. They're aware that Jesus has already flouted their Sabbath regulations, and they're eager to see if he will do so again. Next sentence. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? Now one of the things I like about Jesus is that he could have shied away from causing offense, but his attitude seems to have been, eh, why bother? Jesus could have healed this man at another venue and certainly at another time without causing any offense to his critics. But this offense is deliberate. He's deliberately assuming the role of agent provocateur. He's saying, I know that you're here to see if I will do something with this man on the Sabbath day. So I think I will. But before I upset you, I'll ask you a question. According to your own rules, which is lawful? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or to kill? It's a very simple question. One which the Pharisees should have been able to answer very easily. The writings of the rabbis from the period all concur that it's always right to save a life on the Sabbath. The writings of those same rabbis also concur on the illegality of the antithesis. It's always wrong to kill on the Sabbath or any other day for that matter. So this question is one which the Pharisees should have been able to answer in such a way that makes Jesus look very silly. Because you see, the man in the synagogue with the shriveled hand doesn't have a medical condition which places his life in immediate danger. All he's got is a malformed hand. And so the Pharisees could have easily said to Jesus, well, actually, Jesus, it is lawful to save a life on the Sabbath, but this man's life doesn't need saving. He's just slightly ill. And they would have been right to make such an argument, but they didn't. 
You see, they realized that Jesus was talking about something much more radical than the healing of a shriveled hand. At the time of Jesus, when the Jews spoke about Sabbath rest, they were speaking about much more than the Sabbath that took place every seven days. They were speaking about their hope that one day, one day hopefully soon, God would bring restoration and healing to the damaged, broken areas of their lives. So to speak about Sabbath in first century Israel was to speak about God bringing his rest to an impoverished family that were struggling to get by. It was to speak about God bringing his rest to, to a single parent for whom life was hard. It was to speak about God bringing his rest to people whose lives were ruined by illness and addiction and isolation and injustice. The Shabbat of God in first century Israel is God bringing his wholeness to lives that are currently broken. And when they heard Jesus ask which is lawful, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill, they realized that he was saying, I have come to bring the rest of God to lives such as this. For Jesus' critics, the Sabbath was only about obeying the rules. Don't walk more than 1,999 paces. Don't tie a knot on the Sabbath. Don't cook a meal on the Sabbath. Their entire concept of religion was a checklist of things they didn't do. And if they didn't do all the things they weren't supposed to do, then they thought that they were okay with God. And Jesus says, no. That's twisted. That is to religion what anorexia is to food. It's daft. The test of the Sabbath and of religion and of the orthodoxy of your faith is not found in a list of things that you don't do. It's found in your response to this man with the shriveled hand and the single parent and the person struggling with addiction and injustice and isolation and the family barely getting by and the child in danger. Your response to those things are the test of the legitimacy of your faith. The kingdom of God isn't about coming to church on a Sunday. It's not about singing a few nice songs. By the way, I love that we're now doing requests. <laughs> Next week I want Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we used to sing that back in the day when we were out with <laughs> it's about standing toe to toe, head to head, against the evils that ruin everyone's life. It's about understanding that being part of this God following thing means bringing God's rest to those whose lives are troubled and in turmoil. God is nice. And he does like us. But he doesn't want us to be an uptight group of people who are all about, I don't do this and I don't do that. He wants us to be a group of people who help the troubled, and the tortured, and the isolated, and the suffering. I'm getting this, Jesus calls this man with the shriveled hand into the middle of the religious gathering. He holds up his malformed hand and says, this is what the Sabbath is all about. It's about bringing God's rest and healing and wholeness into the lives where those things are not. Let's say it together. God is nice and he likes me. That seems like such a difficult thing to say in church, doesn't it? 
The church has not given us this impression. The church has given us the opposite impression. God is nice. And He likes me. I think I'm going to do a whole series on that soon. What kind of a difference would it make in your life if when you looked in the mirror, you... You saw someone whom God liked. How would it change the way you react with others? How would it change the way you feel about yourself? God is nice. He likes me. You remember that this week. You teach that to your children. God's not grumpy with you. You're grumpy with you. God's not down on you. You're down on you. God is nice. Likes you. And to remember that niceness and the extent to which He likes us. We're going to take communion together for the first time as a church. Um, We'll experiment with different ways of doing this. Uh, but this morning it's all set up here. So uh, we'll take it on the way out. Um, we'll listen to some music while we're doing it. So let's come this way. So we'll start at the back and down that way and take it on your way out. And then when everyone's gone, uh, those of us in the platinum seats can... Uh... <laughs> oh yeah. We'll go that way. Let me pray. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Father, we receive your love into our tired hearts. Renew us, refresh us, remake us, we pray. Give us the faith to know that you've forgiven us. The belief that you've accepted us. Grow our lives, enlarge our influence. May we be a holy church for unholy people. May through our lives, thousands of souls yet come to know that you are nice and that you like them. We ask this as we remember your life and your death. In Jesus' name. Thank <laughs> you.